back my car, old Chevette, 84. Drove it till the engine smoked, hitched to ride through San Antonio. Got a job tending bar, let a senior in to break my heart. I wanna sink my feet into some Illinois clay. Walk along the cornfield in the cool of the day, get a dog and chase. All right. Well, welcome, everyone. Uh, Going to do a fun episode today here with uh, Casey Seymour with uh, Moving Iron. Um, he does great podcasts as well. I was on there. Well, how long ago was that, Casey? A couple months? Yeah, I think just before Thanksgiving a little bit, right around okay. there. Yeah. Good. You have a good Thanksgiving? I did, man. You? Uh, you know, same as always, just yeah. you know, watching everybody stare at their mobile devices and <laughs> <laughs> exactly right yeah. wait for the turkey to get done so exactly it was yeah. it was very low key didn't have to go anywhere and uh just yeah. got to enjoy some good quality family time and uh now now getting settled in for the christmas season here so yep but yep, uh here. yeah no thanks everyone for joining um wanted to uh introduce our guest today um Casey Seymour moving iron um and I'm going to give him an opportunity to kind of introduce himself, what he does, his background, where he's from, um, just kind of introduce himself to everybody out there listening. Right on. Well, man, I appreciate you having me on. This is awesome. I love I love coming on other people's podcasts and and uh, having a chance to talk from a from a different point of view. It's always always a lot more fun. Yeah. Um, so Casey Seymour, I'm from uh, around the Wichita, Kansas area. Uh, not a farm kid by any any stretch. Uh, had a stint one summer hauling hay. That's about as much of my ag experience that I've got. Um, been in the ag equipment business since uh, 2006 and uh, started a thing called Moving Iron, which was uh, basically a bunch of dealers got together. We're trying to figure out what was going to go on when the uh, 2012 down cycle happened and started doing that and uh, just kind of started doing that ever since. And I started doing my podcast back in 2017, I think. So I've been doing that for a while now, but now I'm out, uh, doing this full time. I've got a, a bunch of different consulting things that I'm working with and, and working with some, uh, a grower on, on how they're um, handling their equipment and what that looks like and doing those kind of things. So I've got a lot of, a lot of stuff out there. I'm just trying to keep all my ducks in a row and, and not overcommit myself to too much stuff than, than I, than I need to. And, uh, so we're, uh, plugging along there, but been out here in Scotts Bluff, Nebraska for about about ten years now. Um, yeah. Moved out here for a for a job that I took, and um, been out here ever since. And and uh, really like living out here. It's kind of like the I call it the gateway to the west. You know, it's where where the landscape really changes, and you start going from flat farm grounds of the Midwest to the to the high plains into the mountains. So it's a it's a really cool, unique landscape, and and uh, gives me a chance to hunt pheasants that I didn't get to do much when I was home. So. Enjoy being out here, man. Nice. So is you said this is what you're doing now is is so I'm clear and the audience is clear. Mm -hmm. Moving iron, how did that start out and how did it morph into a podcast? And yeah. is moving iron, you know, the original still going, or is yeah. it just you doing the podcast and consulting now? No, so the moving iron summit that I have, um, that's still going. Um, that's okay. gonna be the 11th or 12th year, I have to go back and look uh, that we've done it in a row. It's coming up here in 2024. Um, the podcast thing, I, uh, a little bit selfish on my end. You know, I started the uh, podcast as a way for uh, you know, guys like me in the used equipment world, get together and talk about what's going on in, in the marketplace. And I, I really thought, you know, a few hundred people would listen to my podcast and it was going to be one of those obscure, um, you know, niche things that unless you're in the equipment business, you're there's really no need for you to listen. Well, it's it morphed into what you had what it is today where I've got a good following of people and I've got a lot of different um aspects of the of, of listenership that I would didn't expect to have. So um it started out to just be me and some of my friends talking about what's going on in the equipment business, what's happening in the marketplace, uh what machines are moving, what machines aren't moving, those kind of things. And you know I when they're in there talking, I'm taking notes too. So, you yeah, know, I got the old saying, if you steal from me, you're stealing twice probably. So, um, so I, I kind of just went through and figured out what was going and lo and behold, it, it grew into what it is now. And, um, I'm really able to do, 
you know, this moving iron thing full time now and uh, go from there. So it really changed to something I had no intention for it to change into ever. Um, but it's just one of those things that I found a, I found an inch audience and, and uh, it just grows every, every week. So I'm pretty Very fortunate cool. about that. Yeah. Yeah, and I'm I'm just going to let the audience know right now, this is a little different look than our, our normal podcast uh, at a podcast studio down at the Pear Tree Ranch, my old farm, and uh, mm-hmm. I actually wound up, uh, it's been a been a busy little stretch for me, I wound up selling the farm, uh, oh, no. and, and I bought a new one, so mm-hmm. I'm in transition now trying to get uh, the new studio, so I'm, I'm in my office right now with... Uh, with little new look and doing this over zoom. So, uh, that's, that's why we're got the different look going today, but, um, that moving iron is a pri- you keep mentioning used equipment. You do, you don't do anything with new it's, it's just primarily used equipment and you're looking at what's selling, what's not selling, what's in high demand, what's not. And, you know, probably primarily, you know, what is driving the market as far as prices go and, you know, maybe expand a little bit on that. Yeah. So uh, I don't spend a lot of time talking about the new stuff because unfortunately, I mean, the new stuff is what it is and yeah. the pricing comes from the factory and that's, that's that. There's not much way to look at it. Now, what I do talk about a lot is how new pricing affects what happens in the used marketplace, right? Um, you take a look at what we saw happen over the last three years, for example, where, you know, equipment values jumped up depending on what it was, anywhere between 30 and 50%. And that's a huge jump. So you're talking about stuff that already was kind of in that three, $400,000 range anyway. And then it jumps up another, you know, 50%, 40% of whatever it is. And now you're looking at, you know, real crop tractors that are $500,000 used. And that was barely new price. And and do you, I'm not an equipment guy, so mm-hmm. I'm, I'm probably going to ask a lot of dumb questions, but is that primarily, you know, when you say, you know, three years ago and I'm, you know, doing the math backwards and is that primarily due to the whole thing with COVID and supply yeah. change and everything yep. else where it was basically, you know, new inventory was at a low mm-hmm. and hard to get. So used prices just went through the roof. Yep. That's totally it. I mean, okay. it, it was had nothing really to do with anything other than what we saw with the supply chain issues that we saw everywhere across the uh, the world, you know, yeah. just pricing of materials got so high and, and it kind of drove everything up. So, um, <clears throat> so what you see happen there now is that you've ushered in this, this new normal when you look at, at used values and what's that look like. And we're starting to see as, as, um, you know, more new, uh, more new equipment becomes available from the factories and things are kind of, things are kind of caught back up now. That's kind of over with, yep. um, but it all happened at one time and it wasn't a, like an easy transition into it. It was a uh, nothing one day, full lots the next pretty much. And now you flood the market with a bunch of used equipment and we're, we're seeing some of that, what you typically see after any kind of a bubble pops where the normalizing of a market come back and it comes, comes back into play and, we're starting to see those those pricing start those pricing strategies are starting to change as things move down. Auction prices, you know, starting to vary and, and swing. So it's going to be an interesting time in 2024. That's the kind of stuff we talk about on the Moving Iron Podcast. And then the economic drivers behind all that, you know, I've got commodity guys that come on and talk about their guys like you that come on and talk about land values and what's going on there. Um, sure. Start hitting those kind of things. And my focus is you know, where's the money going to come from to pay for the equipment? And, yeah. and then what, once you have the equipment, what are you going to do with it? What's your, what's your investment look like? And that's really what I'm trying to to do on the moving iron podcast. Excellent. Yeah. And we, you know, we touch on just the economic side of equipment because, you know, from our business, you know, okay. Technology obviously plays a role in farming and, you know, we always talk about, okay, you know, the machines today, they're much more efficient when it comes to, you know, the collection of yields, mm-hmm. the, the planters more precise with precision planting and how, how all that comes into play with maybe better yields, which can, you know, obviously have a direct correlation to land prices and in return correlate down to rental rates. So it, it's it's all in this pot of stew yeah. uh, that we like to say, but, you know, one thing that I talk about with growers is, you know, where where does it stop? You know, is is there a point of diminishing returns 
as far as this technology goes, because there's been so much advancement and the prices of machines, you know, have gone up so much like, yeah, they're getting higher yields, but they're also paying a lot more than they used to for equipment. So where do you see that going where it's like, do you see a point where the farmers are like, yeah, it's got all the latest and greatest tech, but I, I don't know that it's worth the money. Yeah. Yeah, and that's something I've been given a lot of thought to. So <clears throat> I just recorded a podcast last night with a g- gentleman that comes on once a month with me. His name's Alan Hoskins, and he's a banker down in uh, Kentucky, Lexington, Kentucky. Yep. And love having him on. Great guy. And we were talking about that very thing. We were, we were kind of hitting on, you know, uh, my question to him was, you know, here you got the subscription-based model coming down the pack, coming coming down the pike now uh, with a bunch of different technologies that are there. As a as a banker, when you're looking at these. Like how, how do you go about, you know, you can't do one without the other. So how, how are you looking yeah. at that and going down the way? I think we're at the first time, as I look at equipment now, we're in the first time where um, that diminishing returns argument kind of got a, kind of gets pushed to the back burner here a little bit. And the reason that I say that is this is the first time where it's beyond, you know, how straight you make your row and it's beyond, um, you know, the, the, the picking of the hybrid that you're going to put in the ground, those kind of things, it's kind of beyond that. What we're looking at machines that are truly going to start um, wavering the, what you're going to do with your inputs, right? I mean, you're talking okay. about sprayers, for example, that are going to spray 70% less, whatever it is that you're spraying, right? Um, you've got technology out there that is now going to do, um, you know, John Deere just came out with a with a product called Sure Shot, and as the seeds falling out of the planter, um, it gets a shot of starter fl- fl- starter um, f- uh, fertilizer uh, as it hits the ground. So it's just spraying just that area and not broadcast spraying that stuff. So um, in the furrow, so you know, you're going to look at it like seventy percent less um, starter fertilizer start when you go through planting. So to answer your question. Up until this point, yes, there was a diminishing return. You, sure. you, know, you can only increase your yield so much. Um, you listen to most seed companies; everybody should be growing about seven hundred bushel corn, no matter where you're at. If you if you see what the, if you watch their commercials, but 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 if you're going through those those cycles, now we're looking at that. I used to go from Gen One to Gen Two to Gen Three to Gen Four, and all those things keep going. Yeah. Sooner or later, if you're not on the cutting edge of tech on technology and farming. I really think that we're at a we're at a point where technology is going to start picking winners and losers. Yeah. And I think if you're just now getting to Gen One and your your neighbors around you are at Gen Five, for example, um, you you're going to have your economies of scale just aren't going to work because those chemical companies and none of those kind of things are going to start getting wise to the fact of well, we can't functionally do this by selling seventy percent less chemical than we did. Well, that, that was going to be my next know. question: is how. Yeah. How does that trickle down if if you're creating all these efficiencies yep. and all of a sudden it's, well, now we're selling 70 percent less yep. chemical. Mm-hmm. Do we just raise the prices 70 percent and produce less? I mean, where do you see that coming in? Because that that can yep. become an issue. Yeah, that's a great question. And, I, you know, the, the easy answer is, of course, they're going to raise their prices by, you know, whatever. Yeah. So they can cover that. Um but it could be, um, it could be one of those things where it's a a per acre issue. It could be you know those kind of things instead of by the gallon, it's by the acre that you're selling it and whatever you know. This is another way to mask the prices that are going to get changed up. But um, it, it's going to be interesting to watch how that how that unfolds and what's that look like. Um, or you know there could be some kind of uh, I mean who knows? Yeah. That's a that's a I thought about that so many times and I've come up with so many different scenarios in my head about what is and what isn't it, it's going to be interesting to watch that play out because like you said you know the 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 cargills and the and the uh and you know the, the chs's and those kind of people like that that are reliant upon um what that looks like it's going to be a big deal for them when you start looking at how do they Absolutely. price their chemical now and that Absolutely. kind of goes back to my earlier statement where if you're Gen one already and Gen three is seventy percent of what you're saving of the seventy percent that Gen one saving. Holy crap! Now you really start looking at, you know, the prices as they start moving. And if you're putting down seventy percent more or something at a infinitely higher price, you know, absolutely. 
You know, it could, well, it could come down to the technology too. What technology do you have is based around the pricing that you get um, for it. Have. I mean, it's, and, and we get into that all the time as people yeah. say, well, you know, you, what you guys do with technology is driving up rental rates. And it's, it's simply not true. It's just agriculture has become very, very competitive. Yeah. And I think people are realizing farming is a big business and it's very competitive and certain people have competitive advantages. And you go back to, if I'm farming 10,000 acres with the latest, greatest equipment, what am I buying my fertilizer at? And if I'm able to afford that new sprayer that's spraying 70, like it's giving you a competitive advantage. Mm -hmm. And that's also affecting everything within the ag community as far as, well, if I'm getting these sorts of deals on inputs and I'm applying 70% less or whatever the case may be, I can afford to pay a higher rental rate and pick up more ground. So I agree with you. Technology might start picking, you know, winners and losers. And, and I think the advancement in technology is only going to further consolidation within the industry. Yeah. Yeah. And you look at the, like you just, you made a great point there about the competitive nature of farming. I mean, we're at a generational crossroads. I talk about on the podcast quite a bit where, you know, you're at a, at a place now where you've got, the generational family that's coming back in that's got several people um in, in in the farm coming back in to, to take over the next rain and you've got an even bigger set of the population that doesn't have anyone coming in right, right. and no one wants to come back to the farm and you're, you're watching you're looking at that and, and a lot of that has to do with the farm didn't grow when it needed to so it can't support x y and z and whatever else there's a million reasons as to what's going on there but the competitive nature of that you know we've got three generations on the farm now and, and get ready to have a fourth come in. Yeah. We've got to expand our coverage by X percent to, to help to pay for another family to come in. We we've had specific examples of, you know, we'll, we'll talk with people after, you know, an auction is done and it's just like, you know, Hey, how'd you like the experience? You know, this and that. And, you know, it's like, Hey, this allowed, you know, we've picked up, almost a thousand acres through your platform. It's allowed me to come back and help farm mm -hmm. and, you know, there's more mouths to feed. So it, it all feeds into each other. And, and I was, we had a little farm open house. Um, we got some new, good new ground, couple of listings in Brown County, Illinois. And we kind of did a farmer open house, like meet and greet lunch and learn type type deal. And, and I was off to the side, um, talking with one of the farmers that showed up and, you know, he was describing it as almost like an inflection point of, I'm really close to getting into a death spiral here because if, if I can't figure out how to grow my operation, it's, it's not going anywhere and it's going backwards fast. And yeah. he was legitimately worried. And, and he was, he showed up to learn like, Hey, how can I pick up more ground? Not as just like curiosity or like, what is this new technology? He was at the point where he's like, I better learn like what tools are out there to grow my operation. And it was a legitimate concern. Like I, I might be out of business in three to four years. Yeah. Because I think that, he yeah. was talking about it of yep. you know, these people with these machines and buying at scale that are farming eight, 10,000 acres. I'm farming 1100, you know, like mm -hmm. it, it's getting to the point where it's harder and harder for the small farmer to you know, make a living. Yeah. And we see that every day. I mean, that's just, that's a, it's a great example of what you're talking about there. It's um, you know, if I can buy 50 bags of fertilizer, right. Or whatever, that's a different price than if I go buy three train car loads of, of fertilizer, right? Right. Absolutely. I get a better price and it's the yeah. same thing. I mean, it's all about economies of scale. And when you're looking at those things come down the pike, going back to what we were talking about earlier, just that competitive nature that you see where guys are, I got to get, I got to turn my 1100 acres into 5,000 somehow. How am I doing that? You know, what's that yeah. look like over the next three years? And do I have, I mean, do I have the, the, the net worth to even make that happen? Do I have right. access to yeah. capital capital even to make that happen? And I think what you're about ready to see here, in my opinion, is that you're going to see a lot more venture capital come into that want to grow something, you know, some kind of crazy, whatever, not, not your traditional corn and beans or whatever it is. They want to grow 
you know, quinoa in Illinois or something like that. And <laughs> they're going to find a guy that can do that. And in order to find that guy that can do that, he's the 1100 acre guy that's hungry for growth. And they're going to get a bunch of capital. He's going to get a bunch of opportunity to go do whatever. Still gets to farm like he wants to farm, but he's growing something different than, yep. than what they're used to doing. And I think that's kind of what, or it could be as simple as, Hey, grow, go grow corn. You know, Mr. And Mrs. Farmer, go, 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 grow all the corn you want to, but we need to know where you got the seed from, when you planted it, what you did to it the whole time it was there. Um, yeah. Now that you've got it coming out now, what's it, what's that transportation cycle look like from where, what, and so that I can tell my consumer that it's organic or it's a whatever and didn't have any chemical sprayed on or whatever it is they're wanting to do Yeah, where they'll get that opportunity, but it's just going to be completely different than what they're used to doing. That brings up two points. And these were two questions that I had specifically, and these are not equipment related. I just want your opinion okay. in around the industry from a traditional row crop grower. He's corn and soybeans, corn and soybeans. Do you see any diversification? And I've got my thoughts on this, but do you think they're going to have to diversify outside of that to maintain profitability? Or is it that you're you're going to be getting into a game that's already way too big? Like it's, hey, maybe I got to get into a little bit of cattle farming or, or, or whatever the case may be that is maybe less equipment intensive, you know, from a cost standpoint, or, or do you just see it as I got to grow, 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 and it's corn and soybeans, corn and soybeans. So that's a good question. So out where I'm out here in Scotts Bluff, I mean, it's very diversified. I mean, you yeah. have sugar beets, edible beans, corn, you name it, they grow it out here. I mean, there's, you know, cattle, alfalfa i mean it's just all kinds of stuff when you get to like your neck of the woods where it's a lot more corn and bean centric um it's like that on purpose right because the stuff yeah. grows really well there right absolutely so, where i think the diversification comes in for the the corn and soybean guy um isn't by necessarily hey we're not gonna take this field and put corn and we're gonna put cows on it or put up a, a hog confinement or something whatever they're doing i don't think that's necessarily it i think no. it's going to be more driven towards you're going to get a you're, you're going to get a whatever you get some kind of a, a contract from a from a big you know some company someplace that makes uh whoever makes like kellogg's cornflakes or something like that and you need to they want a, a certain variety with a certain um uh, product that comes out and they're going to pay you x dollars a bushel for this product um doesn't matter what the market's doing they're going to pay you this amount of money for it i think that's kind of what we're going to see more than anything come into play um because, you know, with the, with the stuff we're seeing in Brazil right now, um, the guy I have my Sean Hack, I have my podcast that talks about those kind of things. This this is this is not going to be a, a kind of a one and done thing. This could be a, a ten or ten year cycle that we're going through in Brazil, and because of the rainforest is how the rainforest has been depleted down there, and it's changing the environment. Well, it's also changing the way rains come in and those kind of things too. So, you know, yeah this could completely change the way the U S farmer operates for the next 10 years. It could, it could almost go back to where it was before Brazil was a, was a big deal. And that's going to change the way people look and operate. Okay. And, and I can totally see that. And in that diversifying and whatnot, this does correlate back to the equipment side of things. You brought up the point of my neck of the woods, Illinois, Iowa, like it's, it's very easy to grow a good crop just based off of soil conditions and whatnot. And, you know, yeah, the weather comes into play, but it's corn and soybeans for a reason. You know, right. it, it makes the most economic sense. So that being said, we've seen the trend of, okay, now we've got bigger equipment, more efficient equipment, and you can plant a field in half the time, you can pick it in half the time. And, you know, we've got just straight row crop farmers that, you know, outsource their spraying, and they're planting in the spring and they're harvesting in the fall. Mm -hmm. And what we've seen kind of tick up around here as of late is these farmers are saying, I want to keep these machines running. I, yeah. I've got the time. I want to keep them running. So they're starting to offer custom. Right. And you're, you're hearing more and more about it. Landowners are starting to learn more and more about it. 
um, you know, the active ones that want to be involved in a little bit of the process. But from a landowner standpoint, like, hey, depending on your level of involvement, it could be a little bit more profitable. It could be a lot more profitable. But we're seeing a lot more of people offering custom farming to say, hey, I'll I'll come keep my equipment running and cover my overhead. Do you do you see that continuing to grow? Yeah, I think, you know, as you take a look at from the custom combining side of it, I, I, I think I think if there's going to be a bigger point in time when that makes some sense to have have that happen. I think the custom side of it is, is, is getting ready to change quite a bit. And I think with the invention, uh, with the adaption of more autonomous vehicles, we start seeing those kind of start coming into play. I almost kind of look at it like, uh, I don't remember the name of the show was, and I've been trying to find it, but it's an old movie from the eighties and Tom Selleck was in it. And it was like a futuristic deal. And there were all these like drones and stuff that were out, they would send out and they'd go kill people. I and mean, he was a cop. He's trying to, it's a whole thing, but, <clears throat> but there were, there were swarms, right? These swarms of these things would come in and, you know, whatever, yeah. do whatever they need to do. And I, I kind of see it as something similar to that, where you're going to see these, you know, it's not going to be one um, planner pull, you know, one tractor pulling a 24 or 36 row planner or something like that. It's going to be uh five, you know, 12 row planners out there running around um, and machines doing it by themselves that are just kind of operating and running and, and they know where each other left off and the next one started and all those kind of things. And I think that's what we're going to see come from a custom side of it. I could see there being like a, like a co-op type of thing where they start in the South and go to the North and that's kind of how, how, how they do it. And it's, but to your point where I see as of right now, yeah, there are some folks out there that are trying to figure out how to, how do I pay for this, you know, $700,000 tractor and this, you know, $500,000 planter. And um, the only way I can really do that is I got to plant more acres and, and, mm -hmm. and either my acres or somebody else's somebody acres. Else's. And, and, yeah. and I've got to, uh, if I'm going to do somebody else's, then I've got to be able to cover my overhead and depreciation, those kind of things that come into play and it gets it out there and, and makes things happen. You know, combine is one of those machines in a planner is the same, same way. The combine gets out and runs two months out of the year, you know, uh, the rest of the time it's sitting in the shed someplace. Planner gets out and runs for 10 or 15 days a year, 20 days a year, whatever it is that the, yeah. that particular thing runs. And it sets out there, sits in a shed for the other 340 days, you know. So it's it's a big investment that you're out there paying on. And with interest rates the way they are right now, you know, 8% on some of the stuff, you can't really afford to let it sit there without producing something. Absolutely. It's different when it was two and a half percent. That wasn't too bad. But now that you're looking at, you know, like that meter's ticking every day on that $400,000 piece at 8%, that's $32,000 a year in interest that you're paying. You know, yeah. that's, that's a fair amount. I mean, you got to figure out how you're going to offset that. So, cause if you don't offset that, you're, you're, you're going backwards in, in, when in the way you're above or below water on that machine. And that's a big deal now that, that are, that guys have to contend with. Yeah. Do you, and I was in a conversation with a guy, you know, we we're talking about just land values in general and yeah, everybody's got their opinion. They've had a great run. You know, is it going to flatten out? Is it going to dip? Is it going to continue to increase? And I just, you know, as I sit here and I have these conversations and talk with people, you know, in various, you know, sectors within the ag community, you almost like go down the path is the ultimate goal just to be the landowner when all this AI and autonomous is really in full swing and, you never have to get in a cab. I mean, you, yeah. it, literally, you've got you've got the valuable asset of the land, and the machines are doing the rest. And and what what that does to displacement, and what the industry looks like, and you know, at at what point you know do we see that? Is it five years? Is it ten years? Where you know people joke like, I yeah, I get in the cab, but I don't do anything. Like right. yeah, you know, like the new the new stuff. I mean, they're yeah they'll joke about it, but it's like, at some point you're not even gonna have to get in the cab. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, I, and that's scary. Uh, yeah. I joke about that too, that you get in a cab of a tractor or a combine or something like that to monitor and monitor. And it's, uh, you know, you can, we're not that far away. I mean, there's always the, the, 
Twitter or X, whatever it's called now, video out there during playing season when the guy puts a 50 pound bag of, of seed in the seat, puts on the seat belt and then jumps out of the, the tractor and watches it drive around. It's the way has it, you know, has a GPS and everything going. Um, so we, we're there we're, we are there. Um, we had the technology to, you can, you, it can do its own thing. Um, you're not, I don't think we're that far away. I mean, I get told all the time that I'm 10 years, um, ahead of my, um, ahead of myself here, but I, I just see this, the amount of technology is coming and how fast it's coming. It's not like it's just, oh, cool, we got this thing. And then five years later, look, look, we got another cool thing. Every five months, something amazing comes out that's just cutting edge. You know, it's not like, you know, I watched those robots that walk through the uh, strawberry fields and they cook off the strawberries. I mean, it's just yeah. all this stuff. And it's a lot of the stuff is being driven by the fact of not out of want, but out of necessity. I mean, this farm labor thing is a big deal. Yeah. And you start looking at that's the reason why machines have gotten so big. It's because it takes less machines to do the thing. Now you have less people. It's all those things that are out there. And this, this autonomous still is, is going to just be just one more um, evolution of that. And that's going to drive that. So I think, I think in five years, we're, we're, we're looking at used autonomous vehicles out there right now. And what are we going to do with them? Yeah. What's that? What's that look like? Well, I'm, my hometown is uh, Morton, Illinois. That's where I'm born and raised, and that's where I yep. live. And uh, Precision Planning just put up a, a building about uh, two miles from my house, just off the interstate. And, I mean, the size of this building, it would rival, like, an Amazon distribution headquarters. Okay. So, right. You know, it, it's yeah. something to – it's a sight to be seen, but it's like – you know, when they're making that kind of investment, you know, long term, mm -hmm. there's there's major things that they're working on, just like everybody else. But, you know, it, uh, it it's very interesting to talk about. And I think you're just going to see a you know, massive change in the industry in the next three to five years. I'm right there with you. So yeah. that being said, if, if you are, you know, back to the equipment, you know, What's your best bet as a farmer? If if you're a mid-sized farmer and you're in, you know, two, three, four-year-old equipment, you know, what do you do? Do you, yeah. you know, it, it's got to be, you know, grower specific, but you're in a tough spot of do I upgrade to compete or do I just keep what I got and try and maintain my ground and my margins and hang on as long as I can? Yeah. So I think manufacturers have done something uh, that has I think it's going to open the door up to the, the I, I do think that the idea of technology is going to be available to everybody and not just on the new mach machines, because right now you have so much of the stuff now that you can, you can add on. Um, things. Now, what I think is going to happen more than anything is that what you're able to retrofit will be, will lag a year or two from what the newest machinery out there is. Right. So whatever, coming off the factory line now that it's the most newest thing ever um there'll be a certain platform that it's on and it might be a year or two before that's you know they come up with the retro kit to fit whatever else i think one thing that if i'm farming right now and i'm looking at my equipment the one thing that i'm really going to pay close attention to over the next three to five years as this thing progresses is where is the cutoff for the latest technology that's retrofitable right um yeah. So I'll give you an example. And I this is I'm just throwing these numbers out here. I have no idea if this this is accurate or not. But if you have a a John Deere tractor or whatever, and it's just hypothetically say that 2018 is the is the cutoff year for the retro kit for to make your tractor autonomous, right? Yep. What's a what's a 17 worth? And what's a what's a 19 worth, right? So yeah. now all of a sudden you're like, okay, well, 17 could for all intents and purposes be completely worthless. Right. Sure. You know what I mean? Like it may be worth nothing. It may be worth something to someone that doesn't care about all that stuff that doesn't want to upgrade to whatever. And they're just going to use the same technology they've always used with globes and those kind of things. But, um, but there'll come a point when that the technology that they're using to just make it steer itself and you're still sitting in the cab, that becomes unsupported. Right. That'll happen. That'll eventually happen. So, that's something I would pay so such close attention to is knowing what that looks like. And when they come out these retro kits, look and see how far back 
is it retrofittable to like a planner? I think you can go back to 2004 on a planner, um, to on a John Deere planner and, and then, you know, precision planning, you know, retrofit stuff like that. I I've seen them do toolbars from, you know, the seventies. So, I mean, it's yeah. just, it's kind of what you're doing there, but that, that to me makes the most sense is to pay attention of how far back is this technology get to. And then once you kind of have that figured out, then you can start making decisions of, all right, cool. If, uh, if 2018 is the, is the cutoff for this technology, maybe I need to start looking at a, a 2021 or 2022 tractor or something like that. So I'm, I'm ahead of the curve a little bit to where I can, you know, as things progress along and the next thing comes out that hopefully maybe my 21 or 22 tractor I just bought, I can keep some, some like, cause I think this retrofit thing is going to actually speed up and it's going to become more and more um, of the technology that we see out there is going to be based in, in the, the, the implement, whether it's the planter, the harvest piece, whatever it is. And, and the tractor is just going to be a big dumb animal out there that knows how to go straight and tells you where it's at. And that's really going to be it. And the technology is going to be a, what's behind that tractor. Yeah. That's, that's a great point. Yeah. You could get left in the dust if you're, one yeah. year off on a retrofit. Oh man, nobody I, wants it, and you're left holding yeah. the bat. I mean, you got something that's that's legitimately a tree row feature now. At that point, you know, it's, yeah. Like I worry, I think about that a lot because I think that's just one of those things that what happens. I mean, what are you what are you going to do? And yeah. it's it's just something you got to figure out. And you mentioned, uh, you know, earlier in the discussion, you mentioned mentioned about you know venture capital and whatnot. And I, you know, I study all industries, and I know within certain sectors, private equity is starting to get heavily involved. And do you ever think or see a point as as things become so expensive to farm and you've got a group of growers that are either staying the same or declining every year, but they they are holding some ground. Do you ever see a roll up from a private equity side to come in and say, hey, we're going to purchase this farm, we're going to purchase this farm, we're going to purchase this farm, we're going to purchase it, and do economies of scale on that type of level where it actually might help a struggling grower? Kind of like a mini co-op type deal? Correct. Yeah, I, think, I can see something like that happening. Um, and I think that's that's going to be the, I think that's kind of one of those things that I, I look at in the future as being one of those opportunities for folks to and how they're going to be able to grow. And it, they're going to have, but the thing about it is they're going to grow stuff that they don't necessarily want to grow. And they're going to have a lot of people telling them how to grow what they're growing. And you're going to have bosses. <laughs> and I've been around a lot of farmers and not too many of them enjoy being told how to grow something. So it's, I would agree with that. So <laughs> any anything else you want to cover and uh, touch base on while while we got some time? We can wrap up here in a few. Yeah, no, I just, I mean, I th I think like we talked about, I think it's one of those deals where uh, there's a lot of changes coming down and down the pike, and it's this is the first time where if you're not if you're not really dialed into what's going on with the technology around you, um, you're going to have a hard time being able to stay viable and functional, um, especially when you start looking at at the inputs and how those are being factored into this. Um, right now, if you are, if you're running a, a scene spray sprayer out there right now, you have an opportunity to have enough organic um, cash in your business that you could see a significant amount of money become up, come free. So you can go rent more ground or, buy more ground or whatever it is that you're doing um, and have that. You don't have to borrow that money. It's already there, you know, so it'll be a lot of changes coming. So just stay on top of it, I guess is how I'd, I'd end it. So, yeah, I, I would agree. And I don't, I don't think it's just from the equipment standpoint. I, no. I think, I think being a grower or farmer in today's world is only going to get more competitive and you are going to have to keep your eye on the ball, like you said, with the technologies and equipment. You're going to have to become savvier at grain marketing as as volatility in the market, you know, yep. you know, continues and embrace the technology, not just on the equipment side, but, you know, even stuff like we're doing, you know, yeah, we're helping landowners, but we're also helping farmers. I mean, right. every, every time we run an auction, you know, we're getting ready to run three more farms in, in uh, La Harpe, Illinois. And, he called me up. He said, my tenant farmer, he passed away. We were good friends. 
I love what you're doing. I'm going to put it up on the site. Well, that gives everybody within a 60 mile radius a kick at that. And if you're not embracing technology and you're not being notified about three upcoming farms where you could add three, 400 acres to your operation, you're missing out. And, And I think, you know, those resistant to change are going to be the ones that tend to suffer. So, you know, be proactive, be progressive, embrace technology at every turn and be savvy and, you know, grow your operation and keep going. So yep. I take. Yeah. I'll say one last thing. And, and this is the, when you were on my podcast and you, and you talked about this, this is the thing that I, because the first thing people think of is, well, Craig's out there, he's doing this thing and he's driving up the price of, of rent and this, that, and other thing. What I found to be the most interesting thing about, what we talked about was nine times out of 10, it's not the the $350 an acre that they go and they still go with the, the $250 guy down here because they know them or there's a young kid. They want to help them out or whatever it is. It's yeah. rarely is the highest bid actually get to get to ground. And that, I found that to be the most intriguing thing out there. Yeah, absolutely. And I, we still see that today where it's, Hey, you know, the landowner is going to look at the top four bidders sure. and you know, he's going to make that decision or she's going to make that decision based off of their own set of criteria and their own set of circumstances. And we had somebody that wasn't high bid the other day get one. And it was like, why did you choose him? Well, he's a younger grower and I know he's going to be on the ground for a while as long as we can maintain a great working relationship. I didn't want the guy that was older that's maybe going to pass it down to the, you know, his sons that I don't know or whatever the case may be. We leave it up to the landowner. It's their asset. It's their right. choice. They yep. can do whatever they want. And, you know, that's something unique that we pride ourselves on. But I uh, you know, great, greatly appreciate you bringing that up. I greatly appreciate you taking the time to be uh, be a guest on the podcast. I always like returning the favor. And uh, you're welcome anytime, my friend. Right on, man. And likewise, I hope to have you back on mine. And uh, thanks for having me on. And I uh, look forward to doing it again. Give a shout out to everybody listening uh, where they can find uh, find yourself at. Yeah, go to... Uh, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, at Moving Iron LLC. You can find me on uh, LinkedIn, Snapchat, TikTok, and Moving Iron, or uh, YouTube at Moving Iron Podcast. And then you go to movingironllc.com for everything Moving Iron related. Perfect. Casey Seymour, Moving Iron LLC, Moving Iron Podcast. Uh, Thanks, everyone, for joining us. As always, we would uh, like you to go and join the Common Ground community on uh, Facebook, and uh, we'll catch you next time. Thanks for joining us, and take care.